Why is trusting the Bible so important for our lives? Well, because it's uh, the utterly crucial foundation for all these things that we've been talking about. And it's important to trust the Bible, not just as something that is true for us or is something that's just held according to your own personal preference, but something that is really true, true historically, uh, something that where the events in the Bible really happened in history. If you'd have been there and seen uh, Christ rising from the dead, you could take a video uh, of it. It's something that's real and something you can touch. Uh, C.S. Lewis said that it's utterly crucial that we understand the importance of faith in Christ. That if it's true, he said, it's of infinite importance. If it's not true, it's of no importance, except as a cultural artifact. But the one thing it cannot be is of moderate importance. Uh, Paul Johnson, uh, a Christian writer, said this, Christianity, like Judaism, from which it sprang, is a historical religion, or it is nothing. It does not deal in myths, metaphors, and symbols, or in states of being and cycles. It deals in facts. Christians believe that certain specific events occurred, and that in time, other his specific historical events will occur. Uh, this being grounded in history is important. It's, it's the basis for it. It's either being true or it's being false. And if you understand it to be true and understand that there's sufficient basis for it being true uh, out there in terms of objective facts, it will affect the way you live your faith in Christ and the way that you speak about it within the world and the way that you live it out uh, in your work, in your marriages, in your families, and in other arenas. So it's utterly crucial we go back and examine the foundations. Now, in such a short time as we have here right now, I can't give a full and complete case for the authority of Scripture. I can only touch on some of the things on the surface and point you to other resources that you can use to be able to address these questions. Uh, but I wanted to give you just a very quick sketch, which you might not understand fully here, uh, for the case for the authority of Scripture that's non-circular and would go something like this, and there would be a lot of uh, evidence that would have to go in with regard to each premise. But the first premise is the Bible's at least uh, generally reliable historical document. And in order to prove that, you'd have to look at the bibliographical evidence, the textual evidence for Scripture, the internal evidence that claims that the Bible makes it about itself, the external evidence, uh, archaeological evidence. Uh, the second major premise is Jesus is a messenger sent from God. And you could look at such evidences as uh, the resurrection and prophecy and miracles and other arguments that would converge on Jesus out of the uh, Scriptures, uh, but just assuming that the Scriptures are generally reliable. Uh, the third premise would be Jesus teaches that the Bible is totally trustworthy. And there are about 200 passages in the four Gospels that you could use to uh, examine that. And the final conclusion would be uh, that the Bible is totally trustworthy. Uh, so there's a case that can be made that you can fill in the blanks, put in the evidence, to come up with a non-circular case for the authority of Scripture. I want to just focus on one aspect of that case, and that is the internal evidence under the general reliability. Because there are a lot of people out there, and you may come across them or hear of these people as you look at uh, television, as you uh, watch movies, as you read the newspapers, uh, there'll be claims that, that the Bible is not something to be trusted. And I want to look at the case against uh, these claims, particularly in much of more liberal uh, scholarship uh, there's a real skepticism about Scripture and saying that much of the Gospels, for instance, was invented uh, by the early church. And that's a question that we want to examine a little bit and give some of the things that are against this. The, the way it goes is that, uh, that the early church, the way this critical perspective goes, is that the early church uh, was addressing certain questions that they didn't have any answers about, so they ended up creating sayings of Jesus and putting them in Jesus' mouth in order to address the situations that they were part of. And so the real question is, is 
the character of Jesus real or historical, or was, it, or was the character of Jesus in, in full or in part created by the writers uh, or the early church uh, authors that were there in these early communities? And I want to give you some, uh, what I think are the strongest arguments uh, against that claim and for uh, the trust in the reliability and authority of the Scripture. Uh, first of all, uh, there's a great problem with this creation of the writers in that inventing uh, the character of Jesus would be something of a miracle. I came across various quotes from opponents of Christianity that actually helped make my case here. Theodore Parker, for instance, says, It takes a Newton to forge a Newton. What man could have fabricated a Jesus? No one but a Jesus. Or John Stuart Mill, who was by no means a believer, said it's of no use to say that Christ, as exhibited in the Gospels, is not historical, and that we know not how much of what is admirable has been superadded by the tradition of his followers. Who among his disciples or among their proselytes was capable of inventing the sayings of Jesus, or of imagining the life and character revealed in the Gospels? Certainly not the fishermen of Galilee, and certainly not St. Paul, whose character and idiosyncrasies were of a totally different sort still less the early Christian writers in whom nothing is more evident than that all the good in them was derived, as they always professed it was derived, from a higher source. Uh, another uh, person that made uh, this kind of claim is Jean-Jacques Rousseau, if you know his biography, anything but an Orthodox uh, believer. Uh, he said, it's inconceivable that several men should have united to forge the gospel than that a single person should have furnished the subject of it. The gospel has marks of truth so great, so striking, so perfectly inimitable, that the inventor of it would be more astonishing than the hero. Or finally, Matthew Arnold says, Jesus himself, as he appears in the gospels, and for the very reason that he's so manifestly above the heads of his reporters there, is in the jargon of modern philosophy and absolute. We cannot, get ex uh, cannot explain him, cannot get behind him and above him, cannot command him. And you can see this if you just do a little bit of investigation. For instance, go back and read some of the early church writers, such as Irenaeus or Tertullian or uh, Justin Martyr or some of the many other writers that are there, and you'll find an immediate drop in level from the level of the New, of the New Testament. Uh, you have Jesus, a character that's fascinated people of every background, of every religion, throughout 2,000 years. Uh, could such a character have been created by a committee or uneducated people in a village that we don't know about? It seems that the Jesus that's there rises above any other individual or group of individuals that you could ever imagine. So Jesus stands head and shoulders like Mount Everest about above all the other perspectives. It's at least something to pause consider in light of some of these contrary claims. Uh, also, the second argument against this is the importance of eyewitnesses uh, that live throughout the writing down of the Gospels themselves and could exert a control over invented stories. Uh, there's a scholar from over the United Kingdom, Richard Bauchman, has written a book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses that argued that the eyewitnesses that were present there uh, during the Gospels uh, writing were uh, ones that monitored constantly, were monitored constantly by the early church. Any claim uh, that something was true had to be checked out and confirmed through multiple sources as being from an eyewitness. It wasn't something that it was easy to have a free creation uh, of stories. Uh, one scholar put it this way, if uh, this critical theory is true and much of the uh, whole stories of Jesus were invented, the disciples must have been translated to heaven after the resurrection. When you add to this a third main point, that the apostles were put to death as martyrs, uh, they all went to their death, or at least except for John, it claims in church tradition, uh, maintaining the truth of that which they had preached. Now we know that people will uh, die for what they believe to be true. That happens a number of different times and we see it within the news. But people will not die, I would say, 
for that which they know to be false. So if the, somehow the uh, disciples conspired to come up with a story and maintain it, you wouldn't think that they would go through the kind of suffering and death that they died. Chuck Colson uses an illustration in his book, uh, Love and God, uh, and the chapter is called Watergate and the Resurrection. He talks about the Watergate controversy that happened back during the Nixon years and how he was part of the White House staff. And initially, uh, John Dean got immunity from prosecution to testify before Congress about the conspiracy to obstruct justice of the silence about the Watergate crime. And he found out how many people crawled over, over each other in order to get immunity from prosecution as well. So he, he saw how easily a conspiracy fell apart under the threat of just a small prison term. How much more uh, would there be in terms of great physical suffering or ultimate death? Uh, so this idea of a conspiracy holding together towards the end just doesn't make sense. A uh, fourth consideration is this, that the time for the creation of the material is too short. Mark was written in the 60s, if not the 50s. Paul received his tradition in the mid-30s. Where is the time for the creation of sagas, legends, and myth? Uh, the, the development of German folklore required centuries, yet the gospel exploded into life in the midst of well-attested history, fully grown at birth. It's a really interesting book out there that at least questions some of the late dating uh, of the Gospels. Uh, it's a book by J.A.T. Robinson called Redating the New Testament. Now, it's rather surprising that he wrote this book because he was known back in the 1960s as being an ultimate liberal theologian, a liberal Anglican bishop. And he wrote a book called Honest to God that shocked many more conservative believers about how many things an Anglican bishop did not believe from classic Christianity, but he wrote this book, uh, Redating the New Testament, not because he'd necessarily changed his theological views, but, but because he felt that the consensus of liberal scholarship was, was dishonest, and he examined the grounds for redating uh, the New Testament, or dating it in a much earlier time period than some of the theologians around him were actually doing. Uh, and he made the case, and I don't know that I would live or die with this, but it's at least an interesting case, that no book of the New Testament uh, should be dated any later than 70 A.D. Uh, and the one of the reasons, he looks at each uh, uh, set of arguments independently, but one of the reasons he gives, and it's a very interesting one to ponder, is that uh, there's no mention in the New Testament of the greatest event that impacted New Testament history. Uh, the great event that uh, impacted the Jewish psyche was the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in 70 A.D. And that was a period where, it seems according to estimates, there were uh, one million people uh, that were killed. And then the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple, and the obliteration of the temple so that even the foundation stones were eliminated. You would think, uh, for instance, in America, people have talked about the the, the Twin Towers and how, how uh, that event will be remembered for a generation or for generations. Uh, how much more would ev an event of that kind of impact, if it had happened just recently, be echoed within the scope of the New Testament? Yet we find no hint or no mention uh, of that happening. Uh, it's at least something that would make you pause and, and go back and at least reconsider some of the uh, individual arguments that are there with regard to the different books, and he examines those uh, as well. Uh, there's a, a scholar, C.H. Dodd, that wrote to Robinson in a letter. He said, you're certainly justified in questioning the whole structure of the accepted critical chronology of the New Testament writings, which avoids putting anything earlier than 70 AD so that none of them are available for anything like first-generation testimony. I should quite agree with you that much of this late dating is quite arbitrary even wanton, the offspring not of any argument that can be presented, but rather of the position of the critic's prejudice, that if he appears to assent to the traditional position of the early church, he will be thought no better than a stick in the mud. Uh, the fifth argument that I would want to 
make is that a failure to take into account the Jewish perspective on memory. And I think this is a, a very strong argument in my opinion. Uh, there are various ways in which memory was addressed, like there was the uh, informal, uncontrolled tradition, uh, like atrocity stories, and sometimes there was a latitude in terms of the facts that was given there. There might be exaggeration in some of those stories, in the more informal, uncontrolled stories. But when you look at the more formal, controlled tradition, or the informal, controlled tradition, there was a very strict tendency in the Jewish culture and in the Middle East in general to be very careful and very exact in passing on the tradition. For instance, in, with regard to the formal controlled tradition, uh, that rabbi, rabbi's teaching was meant to be listened to very carefully by uh, their disciples and memorized uh, precisely and exactly word for word. Uh, one of the ancient documents said that you should not lose even a drop from the cistern of the rabbi's teaching. Uh, there's a book by uh, Gerhardson called Memory and Manuscript, a Scandinavian scholar that goes back and examines that the customs within Jesus' time. And you'll find that, that within that period, uh, there was that idea of very careful passing on of the teaching that were there. And it was true uh, not only in uh, rabbinic circles, but generally speaking, uh, in the Jewish culture. It's interesting that uh, that's true even to this day. Uh, in uh, some Jewish circles, for instance, uh, I had a friend, Bruce Walkie, that was over in Jerusalem, and he met a man that memorized the whole Old Testament in Hebrew and tested him a number of times to see whether that was the case. Uh, later he found out, to his surprise, that the man was an atheist. Uh, you find out also in the Middle East that, say, with regard to Muslims, Many of them are encouraged, and many of them actually do, memorize the whole Koran uh, in Arabic. So this idea of passing on the formal controlled tradition with exactitude was part of the culture that they were brought up uh, to be part of. Uh, the, the disciples were brought up in that kind of milieu. Uh, even to this day, Judaism, Jewish students in a yeshiva, are tested by how well they can repeat exactly the teachings of the rabbis. For instance, there's a, a novel by Haim Potok called The Chosen, where the best Jewish boy, the star there, will be asked by a group of rabbis sitting around in a circle, what does the tradition say about this question? And the best student will get up and say, well, maybe starting in order from the earliest to the latest or vice versa, uh, Rabbi so-and-so says this, uh, several lines. Rabbi so-and-so says this. Rabbi so-and-so says this. Rabbi so-and-so says this. And all the rabbis are sitting around, and if you miss one word, immediately you'll, you'll have a, uh, uh, someone that will immediately correct you because uh, you to remember exactly and repeat back word for word uh, that which was said. Uh, this is true generally in the Middle East, to this day with regard to other things as well, with regard to what, what I would call the informal controlled tradition. Uh, Ken Bailey was a professor over in the Middle East in Beirut, and he wrote his PhD in the parables of Luke and had a chance to go around and travel around many Middle Eastern villages and teach. So he picked up in his 60 years that he lived in the Middle East much of the customs that were present. And he said in many Middle Eastern villages to this day, there are people that are illiterate, people that can't read, that have memorized thousands of lines of uh, proverbs and poetry. Uh, and there's a game that they play where you sit around with 10 or 15 people in a circle, and the first person will uh, state two lines of poetry, uh, and then the next person has to take the last letter of the last word and use it to be the first letter uh, of the first word of another two lines of proverb or poetry. And, and if you miss one word, you're out. And the question is, who's the last person standing? He's seen it happen where in villages where people are illiterate, it will go around several times a circle of uh, 10 to 15 people without anybody going out. He's even seen it where there have been 200 people and will go around a couple times before anybody goes out. It's because everybody's memorized all these lines of poetry. 
Uh, and just to use another example, some American youth workers went over and tried to play the telephone game where you whisper into someone at the beginning of a circle and it goes around and they whisper into each other's ear and at the end it usually comes out very garbled. Well, in the Middle East it came back exactly the same because the uh, kids were, uh, were trained to listen carefully and repeat exactly what was said. That's something that's not necessarily true uh, in our culture uh, that that's the case. But this idea of passing on very carefully and faithfully the tradition is important and especially the traditions around the founding of a community, such as in the Gospels. Uh, Ken Bailey uses an illustration of a time where he went down and visited a church that was founded in the Middle East, a Christian church, and he'd gotten a book that had been written about 150 years earlier about the founding of that church. And so he read through the book, and he went down, and he wanted to check out the stories that were there in the book with the memories of people that were there uh, in that church. And he asked people asked the elders about the founding uh, of the church, and he found out that the stories were there and often repeated word for word in the exact words of the book, not that they'd ever read the book, but that they had repeated the stories exactly and passed them down from elder to elder, from person to person within that community. Now, sometimes he found that with people, the core of the things around that story were a little bit different, but always right at the very core of the story. Uh, it was exactly repeated. So this whole thing of memory, it, I think, is utterly crucial. Uh, I think a lot of the critical theories were founded before we understood a lot of the customs of the Middle East. And this idea of the free invention of stories might happen in some other time in some, some other place. But I don't think that it would happen in Jewish culture of that time or in the Middle East in general. And we have plenty of evidence to that effect. And I think it shifts the whole weight of evidence in another direction. In fact, Ken Bailey, after giving an hour talk on this uh, whole matter uh, of memory uh, and dealing with it in light of the critical theories that are out there, said the Gospels are authentic. Uh, now, he wasn't arguing here that every detail you can prove in this fashion, but he has confidence in light of just this whole thing of memory, much less some of these other arguments that the Gospels are true, that they ring true, that the core of the stories are, are true, and, and uh, we can put our trust within them. Uh, if you look, too, at the uh, utter uniqueness of much of Jesus' teaching, sometimes in these critical theories they would say, if something's utterly unique, then it's certainly uh, authentic within the Gospels. Well, it's amazing how much of the Scriptures are unique to Jesus or utterly unique. Uh, for instance, he uh, uses the words Abba or Father to address God in prayer. Uh, I believe in that culture, that was extremely shocking. Uh, they had the idea of Yahweh uh, written down with only the consonants. Uh, we'll just put it in English, Y-H-W-H. The vowels were not even to be put in because the name of God was unpronounceable. Uh, even in Jewish culture to this day, you'll find articles, uh, even in the newspaper, that go G-D, because you're not to pronounce God. God's name, and uh, the name of God is so transcendent and holy that His name is not to be uh, even said, much less addressed in any kind of familiar fashion. But Jesus repeatedly addresses God uh, as Abba, or Father, in prayer. I believe that was shocking to the religious leaders of the day, and you might even argue He was crucified in part because of, it, because of his use of Abba, or Father. In fact, Joachim Jeremias in his New Testament theology uh, argues that, uh, that there's no parallel to any Jew, any Jew addressing God as Father in prayer till you get to 974 A.D. in Italy. Yet we see it at all levels of the New, of the New Testament in the Gospels. Another lesser-known uh, Thing that's utterly unique in Jesus' teaching is his use of amen. Every time you see within uh, the Bible the words, truly I say to you, or truly, truly, or in the King James, verily I say to you, or verily, verily, the actual word there in the Greek text is a Hebrew word, amen. Now, sometimes the New, New Testament translators allow uh, 
another word to uh, come through, like Aramaic words of Jesus, to come through untranslated. Like, Eloah, Eloah, lama sabachthana, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or Tabitha kum, which he says to the young girl uh, uh, at one place within the Gospels. Uh, but Jesus uses this amen, and amen has a long history. Amen means in Hebrew, it is true, it is reliable, it is solid, it's verifiable. Uh, it was something that all Jews were required to say amen to every praise and doxology, much like we do in some churches. In some churches that are less formal, you'll have people shout out amen in the middle of a sermon, meaning that they believe in the truthfulness uh, of that which is said, and that's the way it was used back in Jesus' time as well. It was mean, meant to underline the truthfulness of what it said. Like there's a story in the uh, book of Nehemiah where the, the scriptures, the scrolls were being read and the, the scrolls were held up in front, of, in front of the people and they say, Amen, Amen. It is true, it is true. Now, usually that's done after uh, the fact of what is said. Uh, like for instance, if someone got up, a pastor got up before uh, the sermon and said, Amen, Amen, I say to you, what would that imply? Well, that would imply that I'm not waiting around for you as noble Bereans to search out uh, the text to see whether you think that what I've said is true and then add your Amen to it. I'm claiming absolute authority for what I've said up top. And that, as a matter of fact, is what I believe people thought when they heard Jesus say Amen or Amen, Amen. I'm sure the religious leaders of Jesus' day were very offended by that. He was, wasn't waiting around for their opinion. It says in the scriptures that Jesus spoke with authority and not as the scribes. And I think one of the marks of his authority was not just perhaps that he spoke authoritatively, although I imagine that he did, but this use of amen was very much uh, at the center of his uh, claim to authority, that he gave the amen before he gave what he had to speak, what he had to say. Uh, it's interesting that there's no parallel to this in Jewish, uh, in Jewish practice. Although people could theoretically uh, decide to put amen at the beginning of a sentence, we only have one parallel, the, the exception that proves the rule. Uh, one letter where we have it in 700 B.C. where somebody prefaces their sentence with an amen. Yet it was something utterly without parallel. Uh, throughout uh, the whole of Jewish history, and yet, yet Jesus does it repeatedly, the mark of a personality and the mark of a person who claims authority. And why was Jesus able to speak the Amen with such authority? Well, I would say it's because He was the Amen. In fact, if you want to look up in Revelation chapter 3, uh, verse 14, one of the titles of Jesus is the Amen. The Amen, it says, the faithful and true witness. Jesus was able to speak the Amen because He was the Amen. A final case of uh, utter uniqueness is Jesus' use of parables. There's no parallel to the use of parables, everyday stories such as the sower and, and the prodigal son and the Good Samaritan, that kind of thing, in order to make theological points. Now, there were certainly stories that were sometimes told, or metaphors or similes, that kind of thing. And there were certainly parables occasionally in the Old Testament, but in the whole time of the period prior to Jesus or during Jesus' time, it wasn't the custom to teach uh, with regard to parables. And yet Jesus, depending on how you count them, uh, gave some 41 different parables. And they were meant to not only uh, clarify the story, but in many ways be a sword to drive home the point to people that were closed. Uh, in light of these and other arguments to the utter uniqueness of Jesus saying, and I could go on and give many more, I just have to point you at some point to uh, other sources that you can look at. But in light of these and other arguments, the burden of proof is on those who maintain the inauthenticity of the Gospels rather than on, than on those who maintain the authenticity. Again, let me say it again. Let me say it another time. In light of these and other arguments, the burden of proof is on those who maintain the inauthenticity rather than on those who maintain the authenticity of the Gospels. 
I, I believe with Ken Bailey that the Gospels are authentic and you can place your trust in them. And there's plenty of evidence to the contrary to those who would criticize the Scriptures in general and the Gospels in particular. Dr. Art Lindsley has given us some solid reasons to believe in the divine authority of the Bible. He has shown us that we don't have to have a blind, unthinking faith to believe that the scriptures are inspired by God. Rather, the evidence is overwhelming when one considers the fact that the, the Bible is written over a span of 1,500 years, with many different authors coming from various backgrounds, written in three different languages, and over 56 different books. And yet, the amazing thing is as we read the scripture, we see that there is common themes and an order that puts it all together. The reason for this is that the primary author of the scriptures is none other than the Holy Spirit who inspired men to write those words. Peter says in his second letter, in chapter 1, verse 16, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And Paul writes in 1 Timothy 3.16, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I challenge you to spend just 15 minutes a day reading your Bible this week probably the same amount of time you spend reading the newspaper or reading the sports column or the gossip column on the home page of your computer. And I believe that as you read Scripture daily, you'll begin to hear God speaking to you and communicating with you through the divine-inspired Word of God. And I believe that you'll be more in love than ever before with Jesus Christ and be that much more effective disciple for Him.